Welcome to the GovComs podcast, bringing you the latest insights and innovations from experts and thought leaders around the globe in government communication. Now, here is your host, David Pembroke. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to GovComs, the podcast that examines the practice of content communication in government and the public sector. My name's David Pembroke, and thank you for joining me. Once again today, we go back into the archive of GovComs to the time when the program was called In Transition, and to my conversation with Russell Grossman, who at the time was the international chair of that very important organization, the International Association of Business Communicators. But Russell's day job was as the director of group communications in the UK government's Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. Russell was also a visiting fellow at the Cass Business School and a very, very knowledgeable man, particularly as it came to discussions about internal communications. He really knows what he is talking about. And as many of you will know, I am a great admirer of much of the communication that comes from Alex Aitken and his team in the UK government. But this is from a couple of years ago, but the learning is as relevant today as it was then. So please enjoy my conversation with Russell Grossman. Russell, just to give us a little bit of background about yourself uh, and the roles that you have at the moment, many and varied, uh, a potted history, if I could, the Russell Grossman story. (laughs) Well, uh, how big is the pot? No, uh, I'm Group Director of Communications at the Department for Business Innovation and Skills of the UK Government. Um, I've been there for uh, coming up for seven years. Uh, The Department for Business Innovation and Skills has a very wide remit. We look over everything policy-wise, from higher education through trade, enterprise, skills, um, all the way to export. So it's a very busy and very wide department. I also have two other briefs uh, at the moment. One is that I'm a director of Engage for Success, uh, which is a non-profit movement which was born out of biz, as it happens, but is dedicated to improving employee engagement and the products of employee engagement for the UK. And I'm also the chair internationally of IABC, the International Association of Business Communicators. Lots to talk about uh, across each of those areas, but where I'd like to focus our attention today is around government communications in the UK. In episode one, we spoke with Alex Aitken and he he painted a very broad picture of the change that's undergone uh, in UK government communications over the last few years. But I'd like to go back to the beginning, really, to understand where did this change start and what brought it about? I suppose the principal um, element of change for the uh, whole programme was the government's reforms to government generally. Uh, We needed and have needed to reduce by uh, quite a lot of uh, amount, the amount of We need to have reduced the amount of money that is spent on government communications by a significant amount. In fact, a reduction of 75% from the 2009-2010 figures to the current day. 75%? That's correct, 75%. That's a vast amount of money. Well, that was the target. Uh, We have achieved the vast majority of that. And we've done that uh, through taking, in a sense, charge of our own destiny. And the uh, genesis of the GCS has been very much been in determining that Clearly, whilst on the one hand we need to make the savings, we wanted to use the opportunity to really upskill and up-professionalise the whole of the government communications uh, approach. Uh, So what was then the government communications network, which was a loose network of professionals working in government, is now a formal service. Uh, And our basic mantra is that we want overall the service to be more skilled, more unified and less bureaucratic. So how did you go about starting to achieve some of those savings? Well, uh, from a leading people change, the first thing was that we got all our directors of communication, of which I am one together, uh, and asked, do we all sign up to this? And pretty much everybody did. Uh, Difficult really not to sign up to the idea of making yourself more professional. 
And we have then taken a project management approach to 11 different reforms, uh, which have ranged from, for example, uh, increasing the uh, single way that we do planning across government, to reining in our regional operation, to upskilling the, uh, um, the way in which we do internal communications, all the way through to things like making sure that we have a rigour in measurement and evaluation uh, of public campaigns. Now, does this mean that you have surrendered your autonomy to the centre, to the Government Communications Service, given that you are the Director of, of Business and Innovation? Well, I am a director of the Government Communications Service. So uh, far from surrendering my autonomy, what we have done uh, is collectively we have come together to maximise the strength that we can put into a common endeavour. But where is, is your priority? Is it to your department first or is it to the GCS first? I have a dual approach. Uh, firstly, uh, my uh, first policy priority, as it were, is serving the ministers and the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. But the way in which I do that professionally it is guided by, is informed by and is enhanced by the Government Communication Service. And uh, as I say, uh, I am very much part of and an integral, an integral element of the GCS. I'm intrigued by perhaps the reaction of the political leaders and the political leaders' offices to the establishment of the GCS and whether or not there was any sense of we're giving something away here, we're giving some control away. There were some queries about that from our ministers. <clears throat> Simply, uh, as you say, uh, are we giving something up? Uh, is the centre, which to be fair is always somewhere where you're not, is the centre coming in? Uh, and I was able to reassure my ministers, and I think my colleague directors were able to do the same with theirs, that far from giving up power, this was actually improving the degree to which we are taking forward the professionalisation of communications. And what about the departmental secretaries or the equivalent of departmental secretaries? What was their attitude to it? Uh, the permanent secretaries were similarly uh, of a mind that provided the service that they get uh, from their communications teams was at least as good as it was, um, they were perfectly content. Uh, and indeed, the proof has been that uh, there has been no shift of power, as it were, from departments to the centre. What we have seen, however, is a much greater rigour in the way that we have measured, evaluated, planned and ultimately delivered communications. What's been the single greatest success of the GCS in your view? Um, <clears throat> it's probably bringing together the 4,400 people who do communications across government and its ALBs, that's arm's length bodies, to create a single force. Now, we're still uh, in the process of doing that, of course. But if I look at this from a person perspective, uh, some of the programs that we've put in, Inspire, Aspire, these are training programs for our, uh, for our leading and in some cases trailing members, uh, th those have all significantly increased the degree to which our people are professional and the degree to which their careers have been built. How have you been able to afford and fund training programs at a time when you were undertaking such radical cuts into the, the, the macro levels of money investment in uh, communication? Well, one of our mantras is, is that actually training is not something that we want to see cut. Um, uh, there is a difference, of course, between profligate spend on inappropriate training uh, and training that is absolutely appropriate to make sure that we deliver the things that our ministers and our permanent secretaries want. And so the training budget is adequate and sufficient for what we require. Uh, we've also been able to partner, for example, with organisations like the IABC to deliver training in a way that has not required us to begin courses from scratch. Mm. So in terms of how it works. How do, when does this GCS come together and what's a typical sort of GCS meeting look like? Well, there isn't, of course, a typical meeting and the service uh, is, uh, in, in one sense, virtual, but in another sense is a series of events and networking that bring together professionals across the service in different disciplines. So, for example, one of the particular areas I'm concentrating on is building up and upgrading internal communications and engagement across the whole of government. Um, and that has meant that in the last six to nine months, we've already held three face-to-face -face conferences of internal communications practitioners across the United Kingdom in a way that previously had never been uh, had never been had never been done. And uh, that has enabled people not just to network together, but also to understand the gaps that they have in their own knowledge and their own practice, uh, and of course seek to fill those. So internal communications is an obvious uh, focus. What are, what are the other areas of specialisation that you're looking at? Uh, we've been particularly uh, attentive to things like measurement, evaluation and planning. 
uh, we look at a particular cycle for communications campaigns. We call it the four I's. They begin with insight. They continue through ideas then implementation, and finally impact. It's just a mnemonic that we use, as we use quite a few in GCS, which is handy to be able to explain uh, to the layman and also sometimes to our own people uh, the way that we're doing these things. In terms of, you had a, a the, the, well, the government did, or the GCS perhaps, had a look at the uh, capability of, you know, across uh, the UK government. When you went and had a good look around, what did you find? The capability reviews that took place of communications operations, which took place in 2012 and 2013, they found that government communications was tactically strong, but strategically weak. Another way of saying this was we were really good in getting our ministers either on the front page or keeping them off the front page the following day, but we were less good, as we say in the civil service, about working out where we would like to move our audiences over the next three to four months. And so uh, a lot of our attention has been in, for example, areas of behaviour communication um, and an attention to campaigns that are delivering defined objectives in defined timescales for defined benefits. So in terms of your team, the, the 100 plus people that you have working with you, how much time do they dedicate to this sort of central role or engagement or involvement in the central role as opposed to how much time they spend on your business. Yeah, it, it doesn't actually work like that. Uh, there isn't a definition between the central role and the role that they play. And to be clear, um, the work of all the individual departmental teams continues to be in policies across the government. One of the advantages of GCS is that it's removed duplication by bringing together different parts of departments working in exactly the way they would have done previously, except they're now collaborating on the three big campaigns we have running across government, which are around growing the economy, fairness and aspiration and Britain in the world. It seems remarkable that you have achieved such a degree of alignment and cooperation and collaboration. I just reflect on perhaps where we sit in Australia and just think, could this be possible? Is this possible to be able to do that? What do we have to do to find this momentum? I think there are three key elements that have allowed us to get so far in the time that we have. The first is um, that we have offered the people in the GCS the opportunity to increase their degree of professionalisation and ultimately the equity that they have in their careers. That's obviously been an attraction. The second is that there has been a burning platform from government that uh, if we didn't sort ourselves out, then somebody would come and sort ourselves, uh, 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 somebody would have sorted ourselves out for us. And then the third is the element of strong, bold leadership and tight project management. Uh, we have a strong, bold leader. You can afford to have one in any organisation. And uh, he has been, uh, not singularly, but with the directors of communication, been able to create the kind of traction that I've talked about. And that's been supported by a prince to approach to project management in terms of these 11 reforms that I was talking about. In terms of the actual practice of communication, what have you seen as the big changes over the last few years? In government specifically? In government specifically. Well, certainly digital media has moved a long way and uh, the degree to which we now use digital um, is, is hugely significant and actually it is just part of what we do. Uh, digital, uh, when I talk about digital, I'm talking, for example, about the way in which we release news uh, increasingly, uh, for example, through Twitter in a 24-hour uh, news cycle and much less through the press releases. There is a view, perhaps provocatively, that the press release is dead. Well, that's not quite the case, but certainly uh, the degree that we use digital means for in addition, for example, distributing photographs, photographs and, and pictures through Flickr so that journalists can access the site whenever they want to, um, using LinkedIn uh, to, uh, and Facebook also to help campaigns connect with those people, those citizens that most particularly um, are interested or need to understand what the government is doing, all the way through to using a whole suite of free channels that are available, uh, free tools rather, that are available on the internet, um, such as um, Evernote or such as uh, Basecamp. Uh, that we actively encourage digital, uh, actively encourage practitioners in government to use for nothing, for free. Within federal, well, within the Australian government, obviously there are policy areas, and their roles are is really to, um, uh, you know, produce the policies for, uh, on behalf of the government. Uh, have you, as communicators, been able to create 
better engagement with policy areas in order um, to gain access and insights from citizens and stakeholders uh, in order to feed into the policy areas and conversely, taking insights out of policy areas that you're then able to feed back into the community. Okay, th this is a core of our role. And one of the ways in which the GCS particularly wants to see practitioners move is to be working hand in glove with policy officials at quite an early stage in the policy development process. Uh, that early stage allows us, for example, to feed in insights through consultation, uh, and it also allows us to be able to play and articulate uh, with policy officials uh, in a way that makes policy uh, more coherent, if you like, to citizens uh, and to businesses. So that's, yes, that, that's very important. And the whole area of insight and the emphasis that we now put on insight makes that even more significant than previously. What's next for the GCS? Well, we have a project called GCS 2020 uh, in which we are looking at what is next, not just for GCS, but actually for the whole communications profession. Recently, we held a series of roundtables with experts from the industry around topics such as digital to ask where things are going next. Uh, we believe that absolutely we need to build on the momentum that we've created. We've just begun a second phase of the reforms, having successfully completed out the first phase. Um, and that, that, that second phase um, is looking looking at tools, tips, tricks and techniques going into 2020 and particularly uh, ways of working and also the ways in which government can spend less money on more impactful communications which are appropriate to the citizen and to businesses. Well, there you go. You have to hand it to them. They really have their hands wrapped around this challenge of content marketing in government. That is our friends in the UK government and more power to them, really doing fantastic things. And I would encourage all of you to, to go and explore the UK government's Government Communication Services website, uh, follow them on Twitter, and take a deep dive into a lot of what they're doing because there is so much for us all to learn there. So thanks again. We've got lots of great programs coming up. Certainly uh, really looking forward to continuing to add some value to you as you take on this challenge of introducing the practice of content marketing in government that will help you to help government strengthen communities and improve the well-being of citizens wherever you may be in the world. So thanks again, and I do look forward to you being with me next week. And if you do get a chance to quickly jump over to iTunes and Stitcher, any sort of review does help us. It helps us to be found and therefore helps us to build this community that we are around government content marketers around the world. So thanks again. Have a great week and look forward to speaking to you then. Thanks again. Bye for now. You've been listening to the GovComs podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes.